This is KFSM TV, Channel 5, Fort Smith. In this vault, videotapes just like this, containing hours and hours of history all across Five Country. It's all part of 70 years of covering news where you live right here at Channel 5. And today, we're actually going to go back to 1977. Thanks for joining us. I'm Darren Bob. And I'm Alexandra Burnley. Darren, what were you doing in 1977? Junior high. I remember a lot of stories that were covered that year, including the death of Elvis Presley. Yes, and in this Five News Vault episode, we are covering the death of Elvis Presley, plus a mysterious monster. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to roll these archive tapes back to back. Enjoy. It was in March of 1958 when Elvis Presley first passed through these gates to become the most celebrated inductee in U.S. Army history. He was only here about four days, but in those four days he impressed everyone he met. Among them was Arlie Matheny, then Captain Arlie Matheny, public information officer at Fort Chaffee. He came in here a nationwide personality and he conducted himself as much as possible as like anyone else. He didn't ask for any special favors. He took his turn standing in line and doing whatever the other trainees had to do, and he didn't expect any particular favors. And I think for a nationally known person, this is a pretty good concession. What effect could you tell that maybe this might have had on the other persons who were processed here with him? And many of them admired him, uh, sure, because of the way he handled himself, because uh, you know, it's a little difficult to sit down to eat your breakfast and have some guy stick a photographer right in your face when you take your first bite. And this was happening to Presley, uh, people all over. And the man tried to eat. And we finally had to get up and just tell the people to get away and let the man have his breakfast, you know, and this sort of thing. And uh, the other guys would laugh and kid him about all of this. But I, don't, I didn't see any signs of resentment among the people that were processing with him or among the uh, cadre that were doing the processing. Elvis Presley is gone now, dead yesterday at the age of 42. And after more than 19 years, there are still those who remember and deeply feel the loss, even those who knew him for only three or four days. The suspension of Chief Paul Courtney and officers John Tefner and James Stilley, along with a part-time officer, came after what turned out to be a four-and-a-half-hour session of the city council. Councilmen took the action after several hundred persons converged on the city hall and angrily listed alleged incidents of police brutality and other alleged offenses. I there because he wouldn't let them search it without a search warrant. He's following these church people around. He's stopping them. He said he thinks they're drunk. Anybody that can stop, they'll get them. The police department in this town, not as a whole, but part of them, are the most unethical people. They're standing just about that tall, as far as I and a lot of other people in this town are concerned. They are that tall. They, I will not call any incidents, but the people in this town know what I'm talking about. What do you intend to do? Well, I don't know. I've been to three or four lawyers today, and I ain't got too much done, but I got a lot of people down here tonight, though. See what we can do about it. Mayor Bill Mabry said that so much testimony indicated that there was more to the problem than idle charges. There's always possibilities. Um, being on a town council, you meet once a month, and uh, of course the only time you know when something happens is when you get complaints from the people. So uh, evidently there's some, something valid in this or there wouldn't be this many people here. Thus, the officers are under suspension with the Highway Patrol and Sequoia County deputies on call. The FBI is conducting a probe into the allegations of brutality. It's hoped a final resolution of the matter can be made in a week. If not, there's a petition being circulated for a grand jury investigation of all Muldrow City activities. Bill Ferris reporting for the News People. The squabble that's been continuing for the past several weeks in Muldrow culminated Tuesday night in a meeting at City Hall that saw several charges made against policemen of the city of Muldrow. Since that time, those officers have been suspended. Today, they broke the silence and told their side of the story. We have come down hard on uh, the drinkers and also uh, marijuana and harder drugs in town there. 
and evidently someone with little power, uh, I'm not saying in Muldrow, but someone in northeastern Oklahoma has, uh, has noticed this. We've made enough of a dent that uh, it has caused pressure like we've got. Uh, that's primarily it. Uh, we feel that the FBI investigation will clear us all of any charges. Also, I'm the one that called for the FBI Tuesday morning before this meeting ever come about. If the true citizens of Muldrow knew just, you know, the hoodlums they have in their community, I'm sure they'd see what was going on. Uh, these individuals that's got their toes stepped on, they're, uh, they're local hoodlums, and some of them are out from out-of-town hoodlums. They're in gambling, uh, narcotics. Uh, alcohol, bootlegging, prostitution, you know, just and everything you can think of. If the council also decides for this uh, unit to stay together, we will continue to step on toes. I will personally. Uh, I don't go for alcohol or drugs, and I'd uh, be just as hard on them later as I am right now. And these uh, allegations that there was two or three different individual officers to to beat up on any one subject, this is all completely untrue. Uh, they pay me $525 a month, and I work 56 hours a week on a minimum, and uh, they pay me to uphold the laws as they were written. And the townspeople the one have appointed their, and their city council, and I feel that they wrote the laws, and they want the laws enforced. But when it comes right down to it, they don't want the laws enforced on their own. Uh, do it to anybody from out of town, but leave the townspeople alone. The officers say that they've received threatening phone calls, and they contend they did nothing more than enforce the law. They say they hope the FBI will have a report ready by the middle of next week, and they say they are confident it will exonerate them. From Muldrow, Oklahoma, this is Bill Ferris reporting for the News People. According to Marble City residents, recent rains have removed the white residue that can totally cover everything in the area from vision of the naked eye. But evidence of what lime dust and processed lime can do is still prevalent. Thick corrosion on vehicles, wearing away of paint, roads and telephone poles gone gray. Attorney Jim Jones, who helped a property owner get the lime company declared a private nuisance 10 years ago, and now represents the nine plaintiffs in a suit declaring it a public nuisance, tells the news people why it's important to do so. Well, Lynn, the uh, State Department of Health has been involved in this uh, business, and I have been involved uh, for a period of a long, a long period of time, and uh, unless the uh, public and the people who are owners of property adjacent to this and who live there are able to get uh, some relief in court, then they're going to have to tolerate the dust apparently forever. Just how serious is the situation for them? Well, it's serious enough that the Department of Health has uh, uh, gotten quite involved in it and have issued, so I understand, an order shutting down one of the plants, or one of the kills, until they can come in compliance. Also, the uh, state game rangers have filed uh, criminal misdemeanor charges for pollution of the Salisaw Creek, which runs next to the town and through the property. Irritating to the eyes, and uh, uh, they cannot uh, use the vegetables out of their garden, and it uh, will absolutely destroy the paint on automobiles, and it uh, destroys the paint on houses, and it has that type of effect. An Oklahoma Supreme Court decision in 1962, one Jones says is very nearly identical to the suit filed by residents near Marble City, ruled against a lime quarry operation in Tulsa. But residents say spoiling the land and ruining vegetable gardens is only the surface of injury to life in the rolling cooks and hills. Residue and waste from the lime operation is spilled into the Big Salisaw Creek. One resident laments, the whole community used to come down to this hayfield for fish fries and fellowship, but not anymore. I'm Lynn Kelly for the News People. This is KFSM-TV, Channel 5, Fort Smith. Welcome back. 1977 was a year for some big stories, including the crime spree of Paul Ruiz and Earl Van Denton. Yeah, the two escaped prison in Oklahoma and left a trail of death behind them, including Magazine Town Marshal Marvin Ritchie and Park Ranger Opal James in 1977. The two were uh, finally arrested in Oregon, and after weeks and weeks and weeks, they were finally brought back to Arkansas to stand trial. 
The King Air turboprop landed about 9.45 last night with Ruiz and Denton aboard with five Arkansas law officials. And they were met with the heaviest security force gathered since President Ford's arrival here several years ago. The media was kept some distance away from the suspects, apparently because of a tip to lawmen that friends might try to aid them in an escape attempt. There was no such attempt, but an alternate route had been prepared. Ruiz was taken to the Sebastian County Jail in Fort Smith, Denton to the Franklin County Jail in Ozark. Ruiz and Denton have been charged with capital felony murder in the slaying of magazine town marshal Marvin Ritchie and park ranger Opal James. Their first court appearance is expected to be Thursday before Judge David Partain in Boonville to discuss legal counsel for the two. That will follow lineup proceedings involving apparently the only eyewitness to one of the murders. I'm Lynn Kelly reporting for the News People. According to Sebastian County Sheriff Bill Cothram, the prisoner housed here, Paul Ruiz, has not said anything since his arrival Tuesday night, not even to give his name, date of birth, or next of kin until he gains legal counsel. Two state police units headed by Captain Buren Jackson arrived about 12.15. Two armed troopers stood duty as Ruiz was ready for transport. Logan County Sheriff Dub Hamilton and two deputies arrived about 12.40 to complete the arrangements as other police and sheriff's personnel began to assemble in the parking lot. Then Ruiz, accompanied by Hamilton and a deputy, began his walk down the courthouse steps, fitted in leg iron, chain, and handcuffs, flashing defiant glares at the news media recording the event. He continued the practice of no talking, begun on the flight back from Oregon, where he and Denton had fought extradition to Arkansas for nearly two months. Ruiz slowly entered the sheriff's car, and it, along with state police escort, left Fort Smith for his court appearance. From the Sebastian County Courthouse, I'm Lynn Kelly for the News People. Bill Guffey has the story on the transport of Royal Van Denton and the hearing at Boonville. A crowd of more than 100 stood outside the South Logan County Courthouse waiting to get their first look at the two men who are charged with killing popular magazine Marshal Marvin Ritchie and park ranger Opal James. Security was tied at the courthouse with an area cordoned off for the prisoner's arrival. The first to arrive was Paul Ruiz, escorted by Logan County Sheriff Dub Hamilton. Ruiz was followed by Earl Van Denton with Franklin County Sheriff Bob Pritchard. In the packed courtroom, Ruiz and Van Denton were told of the charges against them, capital murder, and District Court Judge David Partain appointed two lawyers to represent them. They uh, were inquired of as to whether or not they had counsel or could retain counsel and answered in the negative. The judge repeated all this uh, to be absolutely certainly understood what was being asked. They indicated they did want counsel appointed. He appointed Mr. Don Langston and Mr. Bob Blatt, both Fort Smith, to uh, be their counsel as of this date. Emotions are running high here in Logan County. Do you anticipate any problems in selecting a jury? Due to the nature of the charge, uh, I imagine we would have to have a very large jury panel to get uh, uh, 12 with some alternates who can you know, truly be completely unbiased and unaffected by any uh, rumors or news stories or anything else they've heard. It would be more difficult than it would were it a, a less well-known case. Williams said that Ruiz and Van Denton will have to meet with their two lawyers before a date of arraignment can be set, and said that it could be at least a week to 10 days before arraignment, and at least 45 days, maybe even twice that, before the actual trial gets underway. I'm Bill Guffey, reporting from the South Logan County Courthouse in Boonville for the News People. Tight security once again encircled the arrival and departure of Paul Ruiz and Earl Van Denton. Shortly after 10, the two, still handcuffed, entered the guarded courtroom with their lawyers, Bob Blatt and Don Langston. The defense entered two motions for the court to consider after the defendants both pleaded not guilty to the four counts against them. One for a bill of particulars, the other for Ruiz and Denton to undergo psychiatric examination at the state hospital. To say at this time, really, uh, we're just going to have to wait until uh, the, they get back from. The, they're going to be sent to the state hospital probably uh, this weekend or first of next week, and uh, until we get the report back from the state hospital, we really won't know what to do about filing any additional motions or anything, and we're just going to wait and see what happens with the examination down there. 
Uh, I'll be discussing that this afternoon with Sheriff Hamilton. Uh, I doubt it would be today, of course, but I anticipate within the next day or two. What about the Bill of Particulars? What do they ask? Well, they're just asking for more specific dates as to the uh, different counts in the charge itself. Uh, most of this information will, will be provided to them anyway. This is something they're supposed to file, and they filed it, and we will respond to it. Just to say in more detail than what the law techni technically requires us to put into a criminal information. In the information, there was no mention of the attempted murder of David Small. Will, it be, will that be uh, tried separately? That is being treated as a separate case through inadvertence and strictly no one's fault. That information was filed under the same case number as the uh, capital murder case. Uh, clerk happened to be here today, and we did catch the fact they were under the same number, and he's going to set up a separate, separate file on that, and they will be treated as completely separate charges. Prosecuting attorney Paul X. Williams, Jr. further stated he did not feel the proceedings would be a long, drawn-out affair, that it should get off the ground quickly after the 30-day examination is complete. I'm Lynn Kelly for the News People. The two were found guilty of murder, sentenced to death, and they were eventually executed in 1997. On his tracks, from his heel to his toe, was 54 inches. You know, he had to spread out like that. I wanted to see for sure if I thought somebody had done it, so I, I made a track by hitting, you know, by spreading out like that. I couldn't make a track, I'd make a hole that ground us the soft. So we tracked him out here and down and around over yonder and back, and back in here. You can see where he come in and out. And there's something down here, or uh, AL and him seen it. They said it'd weigh 160 or 75 pounds, and about five and a half foot tall, and it walks like this when it when it walks. You know, it walks on its back of its leg, and and it, for everyone that's seen it, he walks like that. Beer, see where he go in there and eat beer? But here's his trail right here. You think that he he was actually staying in this area? Oh, I know he was because you can see where he bedded down, and then we seen his tracks where he went in the field and where he come back. How many people have been out here to look for him? Oh, uh, probably a thousand. Have they had any luck? No. They actually they they come looking, but they don't ever get out where they think he's at. They can get around ages, you know. They just looking, just hoping to see him. But as far as seeing him, well, they're going to have to get in these woods to do that. Do you think he would be violent? I don't think he would if uh, just one man walk up on him. I don't know now. He could be. But what I think, he got away from a circus or a carnival or something or other. And I think he knows what people is. And uh, if one man would just fuss at him a little and put a rope on him, he could probably lead him right in. But you crowd him and shoot him or cripple him, you, you probably couldn't do nothing with him. Ed Bailey of Dutch Mills is known as a no-nonsense, down-to-earth, quiet man, not the type given to tall tales or practical jokes. So his friends and neighbors took notice this morning when he said that someone or something broke into his dairy barn last night. Bailey says he doesn't speculate on what it is or what it could be, he just knows it was there. Uh, I come down to milk. I don't live here on the place, and I usually come down about 5.30 or 6 o'clock to milk, and I come in and I notice the, the screen door had been scratched, and I've always kept this latch turned like this, and it, something had scratched it and, and opened the door and gone in and got into the feed barrel and ate some of the feed. Uh, you think that was mainly what it was after the feed in here? I think so because I've, I've looked on the feed tank there and looked like maybe some mud on the side of it and where he might have reared up on it and tried to get in it and couldn't do it so he decided to go on in. There are some people who live fairly close here. Did uh, they give any indication that they might have heard or seen something last night? One of the neighbors said that his dogs were barking long about three o'clock in the morning, uh, but that's the only thing that we've heard. 
Uh, do you anticipate that uh, once this uh, animal has found food here that it might try to come back? Well, some of the people that's been here this morning said that that it has been known to return, so I don't know if he, if he does, he'll be here by himself. <laughs> You're not going to sit and wait for him then? No, he can, he can have anything he wants. Dutch Mill received two inches of rainfall yesterday and tracks 11 inches across were found near the barn. An official of the Adair County Sheriff's Office said the footprints found at the Bailey Farm are much clearer and appear to be the same type of tracks left at the location of reported sightings near Stillwell, seven miles away. The tracks are being preserved so they can be studied by the researchers who are scheduled to comb the area tomorrow. Bill Guthy reporting from Dutch Mills for the News People. This is KFSM-TV, Channel 5, Fort Smith. Officials of the Arkansas State Police, Crawford County Sheriff's Office, and the Van Buren Police Department confiscated the truck last night after receiving a report that a truck loaded with untaxed beer was moving into Arkansas from Oklahoma. The truck was loaded with 2,000 cases of Coors beer, which is not distributed in Arkansas, and it was on its way from Kingfisher, Oklahoma, to Farmersdale, New Jersey. The beer spent the night outside the Crawford County Jail, and the driver was arrested and later released on $1,500 bond. Uh, right now, we have charged the driver of the vehicle with three uh, misdemeanor charges. Uh, one, of course, is the possession of untaxed liquor, uh, the beer being taxed in Oklahoma only. Uh, also, uh, over possession, of course, in a dry county, Crawford County. And then, thirdly, a violation of a Arkansas Transportation Commission uh, regulation, that being no authority. Uh, uh, the driver of the vehicle was also uh, employed by the lessor uh, of the vehicle, and that is in violation of our Transportation Commission regulations. This is kind of a unique situation. Had, has this ever been done before? Could it possibly develop into some type of test case? I don't really think so. I think our law is very clear on it uh, uh, as to what other states or other counties might, uh, the position they might take, certainly I, I, I don't know. But uh, I think our state laws are very clear. Uh, I think that these people are clearly in violation and, and uh, we certainly don't want to encourage, uh, you know, if, if this is going to be transported, we don't want them transporting it through our county. And uh, uh, as far as I can tell, it's a violation of the Arkansas statutes. And as uh, long as it is, well, we're going to take the appropriate action when the situation arises. There's an irony in the situation in that all of this beer, 2,000 cases worth approximately $15,000, may not do anybody any good. According to Arkansas statutes, the beer is to be turned over to the mayor in the municipality, the mayor of Van Buren, to be sold. However, Arkansas law forbids the sale of Coors beer in the state, and Crawford County, which is a dry county, forbids the sale of any kind of beer. So there may be no choice but to destroy the beer. I'm Bill Guffey, reporting from Van Buren for the News People. Two years ago, Dave McMahon had one of two silos on his Bell Point Ranch, east of Fort Smith on Highway 22, painted to exactly resemble a Budweiser beer can. It cost more than $3,000 to do the job, but it was good advertisement since he's the Fort Smith and area distributor for that product. Yet, he had no idea that Anheuser-Busch would decide to use it in a series of commercials. We're all out here on the, uh, on the site here to, to shoot this magnificent Budweiser silo and uh, it takes a lot of organization. We've got an entire crew here, and it's got to be planned. But in reality, what's going to happen on the scene is we're going to be having that painter paint the eye so you don't tip it off to the audience. And then as we pull back, the singers will be sing singing, forgive my singing, when do you say Budweiser? And then we'll just pull back. And as we pull back, seeing this beautiful scene of the silo and the painter, the painter will say, 
with every stroke of my brush. But he was saying this whole thing would take about 15 seconds. Any idea on how much film you'd use to get that 15 seconds? Uh, well, we'd, we'd use maybe 3,000 feet. How many people are with you? Uh, we brought um, 11 people came in from California, two agency, two actors, and the rest are crew. This particular commercial was part of a package. We're actually doing uh, three commercials as part of this same package. Some of these, this campaign is running on the air now. You may have seen it. Uh, the singers ask the question, and uh, then the um, actors answer it. Anheuser Busch has a magazine which they call Team Talk, which goes all our wholesalers and all their employees and so forth in their organization. And uh, they did a feature article in, in May on this silo because of, you know, naturally Anheuser Busch people would be interested in it. And then DRC Advertising Agency, who handles a Budweiser account, uh, saw it and they thought that it just might fit for a uh, television commercial for this fall. And so here we are. And so that's really the idea of the whole thing. So something that started locally will be selling the product nationwide. Yes, that's true. Right here in our own town, there's nothing like it in the world, I, I don't imagine. Bill Ferris reporting from Bell Point Ranch near Lavaca for Area 5 News. We hope you enjoyed this blast from the past. And now we want to know, where were you in 1977? Do you remember these stories? If you do, text us, 479-785-5000. Tell us what you remember about those stories from 1977. So from inside the vault, I'm Darren Bob. And I'm Alexandra Burnley. Thanks for joining us.